the gangster through the eyes of Hollywood. For a generation of moviegoers, the mobster and the bank robber are a new breed of folk hero. To a public hungry for sensation, theirs seem lives of glamour, excitement and daring. But the true stories of the men and women on whose careers Hollywood builds an industry are both more sordid and more tragic. May 23rd, 1934. Law enforcement officers inspect the bullet-riddled car of the legendary Bonnie and Clyde. Still inside lie the bodies of the couple who are America's most wanted outlaws. Amongst the lawmen of Texas, it was widely believed that Clyde Barrow possessed an uncanny sixth sense, which served to warn him of impending danger. But on this occasion, Clyde's intuition had failed him. In their three-year career of robbing banks and gas stations, Bonnie and Clyde had between them murdered 12 men. Most of their victims were police officers. Clyde Barrow was an expert marksman. Bonnie Parker was feared as one of the most ruthless gangsters who had ever lived. Finishing off a wounded patrolman with two shotgun blasts, she is heard to remark that his head bounced just like a rubber ball. The long campaign to capture or kill Bonnie and Clyde had led police to a lonely gravel road in the state of Louisiana. A tip-off had revealed that the pair would take this route on their way to an isolated farmhouse hideout. For three days and nights, six officers lay in wait amongst the trees. At nine o'clock in the morning of May 23rd, their patience was rewarded. As Bonnie and Clyde's car came within range, it was met by a hail of gunfire. The high-powered police rifles were loaded with steel jacketed bullets. Dozens of shots penetrated the door on Clyde's side of the car. Many passed clean through Clyde's body, through Bonnie, and exited through the door on her side of the car. Death was instant. The vast arsenal of weapons that Bonnie and Clyde had in their possession astonishes the lawmen. Hidden on the back seat of the car, under a blanket, are two sawn-off shotguns, two automatic rifles, 10 automatic pistols, and 1,500 rounds of ammunition. The police officers who tracked and killed Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker will become for a time national heroes. But in the romantic legend which will grow around the memory of Bonnie and Clyde, they will come to be seen as cold-blooded and heartless killers. Bonnie's burial was attended only by close friends and relatives, numbering about 150, including her sister Billy Mace, who was a prisoner of the law, charged with the killing of two state highway patrolmen, for which crime her sister Bonnie had been accused. Billy Mace was attended at the funeral by two deputy sheriffs and a matron of the jail. Clyde Barrow's mother and father seen in the background and his brother also paid their respects to the girl who was Clyde's only friend and who died by his side. In the last few words of Bonnie's own poem, which she penned just prior to her death, to a few it means grief, to the law it's relief, but it's death to Bonnie and Clyde. It is back in the 1920s that the romance of the gangster first captures the imagination of the American public. The cause is prohibition. Prohibition is the most unpopular law ever passed in the United States. The price of prohibition will be heavy. It will be the direct cause of the greatest crime wave in American history. 
The bootleggers and the racketeers will become public heroes, supplying what most believe to be a legitimate demand. There is little the authorities can do to stamp out such a lucrative trade. Prohibition will produce some of the richest, most powerful, and most admired gangsters in the United States. It is in rural America that prohibition has its roots. In the small frontier towns and across the Midwest, an anti-vice movement has been growing steadily. Since the 1840s, the crusade for total abstinence from alcohol has been gaining momentum. For the men who work the isolated farms and ranches of the West, visits to a town can be weeks apart. When they do visit, many drink until they drop. In the eyes of the respectable, drink becomes associated with fighting, prostitution and gambling. The Anti-Saloon League finds little difficulty in persuading many that the answer is total prohibition. It is widely believed that if alcohol is banned, then vice will disappear with it. A vocal and organized political lobby begins to work on the candidates of Republican and Democratic parties. It is the First World War which finally opens the door to prohibition. Much of the campaign against prohibition is funded and organized by brewers. Many of these are German Americans. They also fund such groups as the German American Alliance. When America enters the war, the German Alliance is banned. The brewers try to buy newspapers to publicize their campaign against prohibition but are accused of plotting against America's entry into the war. Beer is fast becoming unpatriotic. In 1917, in the throes of war hysteria, Congress passes the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, proclaiming a total ban on alcohol. In the following 16 months, 45 states endorse prohibition. On January 17, 1920, the Volstead Act is passed, giving the authorities powers of enforcement. The Anti-Saloon League hails prohibition as the dawn of clear thinking and clean living. The innate cynicism of many Americans towards their politicians is confirmed. The comedian Will Rogers remarks, with Congress, every time they make a joke, it's a law. And every time they make a law, it's a joke. By the time Congress realizes its mistake, it will be too late. Organized crime will have arrived to stay. From the beginning, the enforcement of total prohibition is almost impossible to achieve. Near beer, beer with less than one half percent alcohol is still legal. Breweries can still operate. But to produce near beer, the real beer must be made first and the alcohol removed. Some brewers quickly realize the profit potential of supplying with near beer the alcohol which has been removed from it. An alternative favored by many bootleggers is to add to near beer a finely judged quantity of industrial alcohol, the manufacture of which is still legal. During the years of prohibition, U.S. industrial alcohol production will rise from 28 million gallons a year to 180 million gallons. Such poor and dangerous substitutes are not for the rich. They can afford real whiskey or brandy smuggled from Canada. Over five million gallons are illegally imported every year. Smuggling cases of brand name spirits is for the most part a business dominated by small time operators. 
The only qualification is a fast boat and a lot of nerve. But the real money is elsewhere, in illicit breweries, distilleries, and speakeasies. It is clear that in the major cities, anyone who can organize the thousands of small-time bootleggers into a full-scale industry will make a fortune. In Chicago, only one man has the necessary power. He is Diamond's Jim Colosimo. Colosimo had risen from working as a street sweeper to owning a pool room in a saloon. He is the Italian protege of two Irish politicians, John Coughlin and Michael Kenna. Alderman John Coughlin is one in a long line of racketeers to climb to political power in Chicago. He and his partner, Kenna, have collected a fortune in bribes from Chicago's thriving trade in prostitution and gambling. Jim Colosimo's job was to deliver to them, by any and every means, the valuable Italian vote. Under the protection of Chicago's corrupt politicians, Colosimo forges the beginnings of an empire. Colosimo quickly finds that success has its price. There is one threat from which his political masters cannot protect him. He has been receiving threats from a shadowy extortion syndicate calling itself the Black Hand. In response, he sends to New York for someone he can trust to organize his protection. Johnny Torrio is a product of New York's notorious Five Points gang and has already proved his worth as a reliable and vicious hoodlum. Torrio not only deals ruthlessly with the Black Hand extortionists, he expands Colosimo's chain of brothels and extends his business into gambling. At the start of Prohibition, it is Torrio who masterminds Colosimo's move into bootlegging. Johnny Torrio has already acquired a protege of his own. He has brought from New York a young member of the Five Points gang, Alfonso Capone. His nickname is Scarface. Equally proficient with a gun or a knife, Capone is given a job at the Colosimo Cafe. In spite of its outward appearance, Colosimo's is one of Chicago's most luxurious clubs. Soon Capone is promoted to become one of Jim Colosimo's personal bodyguards. At the beginning of the Prohibition era, even transatlantic liners from Europe docking in the United States have their beer and spirits confiscated. All over the country, Prohibition enforcement agents are already tracing sources of illegal alcohol and making their arrests. But in Chicago, where rackets of all kinds are protected by the powerful, arrests will be few and far between. In Chicago, the potential value of the bootlegging industry runs into hundreds of millions of dollars a year. For $5,000, almost anyone can be killed. Prohibition brings with it a wave of gangland murders. The near civil war into which Chicago will plunge will claim as one of its first victims Jim Colosimo himself. He is shot dead in the foyer of his own Colosimo cafe. It is rumored that behind the murder are Johnny Torrio and his sidekick Al Capone. <laughs> Jim
Jim Colosimo's legacy of clubs, speakeasies, and gambling houses passes the Johnny Torrio. By 1922, he is paying Al Capone the enormous sum of $2,000 a week to run his chain of brothels. Now Johnny Torrio makes him the offer of a partnership. Capone will get half the proceeds of bootlegging, plus one quarter of the profits of the remaining rackets. Capone does not hesitate. At 23, he is on the road to earning a new nickname, the Big Shot. By 1924, Capone runs an illegal casino. 161 speakeasies are open night and day. He controls a string of brothels. Capone and Torrio are earning $100,000 a week. The greatest obstacle to the ambitions of Capone and Torrio is the racketeer Dion O'Banion. O'Banion's territory is on the north side and his headquarters are fronted by a flower shop. O'Banion is credited with 25 killings. He is renowned for carrying three guns and being able to shoot with either hand. On November 4th, 1924, O'Banion is murdered in cold blood in the front of his flower shop. The assassin has been hired by Torrio and Capone. O'Banion's funeral is a lavish affair. His coffin is silver and bronze. The funeral cortege is accompanied by 26 truckloads of flowers. A single basket of roses carries a card with a message from Al. It is the beginning of a gang war in Chicago, which will leave almost 500 dead. By 1927, Capone has eliminated or struck deals with all his major rivals. He has a virtual monopoly of bootlegging in the city. Johnny Torrio has retired to Italy. Capone is his successor. He is now earning $105 million a year. Capone's lifestyle is that of a prince. He is impeccably tailored. He wears a rose in his buttonhole and a diamond solitaire in his tie pin. The diamond is the unmistakable sign of a big shot. Capone has two fortified headquarters and a sprawling estate in Palm Island off Miami Beach, Florida. But the price of Capone's success is living in a state of constant fear. He buys an armored limousine fitted with bulletproof glass. It weighs seven tons and costs $20,000, a fortune in 1927. Capone fears only his fellow racketeers. He believes he has little need to fear the law. He's bought politicians, judges and policemen. He has bribed juries. If things misfire and one of his men is sentenced, a friendly governor will grant early parole. By 1929, gang warfare has flared up once more in Chicago. 
The new leader of the O'Banion gang has sworn that the old vendetta must continue. Bugs Moran has acquired his nickname because whenever he loses his temper, he seems to go insane. He terrifies even his own men. But Capone has decided to strike first. On February the 14th, St. Valentine's Day, 1929, seven of Moran's top men are lured to a garage and shot dead. Al Capone has arranged a cast iron alibi. He is discussing his Miami home with a municipal official. By 1929, Al Capone is so wealthy he can afford to lose $10 million at the racetrack. He once has an IOU for half a million dollars accepted without question. At the peak of his career, Capone now controls 10,000 speakeasies. His alcohol, gambling and prostitution rackets earn him an astonishing $12 million a week. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre has confirmed Capone as the big shot. It will also prove his downfall. So great is the public outcry that the authorities are forced to prove, once and for all, that Capone is not above the law. He is arrested, charged with possessing a concealed weapon, and jailed for a year. Dozens of his breweries and distilleries are raided and destroyed. In one year, 50 of his heavy trucks are seized. For Al Capone, it is the beginning of the end. While Capone serves his time believing that on his release he can simply pick up where he left off, the outside world is changing. The stock market has crashed. The United States is sliding into the Great Depression. Three million men are out of work. The public mood of tolerance for the big time racketeer is turning to contempt. The authorities now brand Capone public enemy number one. In June 1931, Al Capone is indicted on the charges that will end his career. He is convicted of tax evasion, fined $50,000 and jailed for 11 years in a federal penitentiary. By the end of 1931, it is clear to all but the most die-hard temperance campaigners that prohibition has been one of the greatest mistakes in American history. It has been an unmitigated disaster, virtually handing the country over to the mobs and the racketeers. All over the United States, anti-prohibition parades attract up to 100,000 marchers. In 1932, the Democratic Party adds the repeal of prohibition to its list of election promises. The result is a landslide victory for Roosevelt and the Democrats. In February 1933, prohibition is repealed. The repeal of prohibition is greeted with delight by the vast majority of the American people. Alcohol is not only legal, but it costs a fraction of the price once demanded in speakeasies. The government gains a new source of revenue from taxation. Breweries and distilleries promise tens of thousands of much needed jobs.
But the repeal of prohibition will not spell the end of organized crime in America. Rich beyond their wildest dreams, the criminal syndicates simply turn to other rackets. In 1939, Al Capone is paroled from jail after serving eight years of his sentence. He retires to his estate at Palm Island, the estate where he had once entertained a hundred guests at a time at weekend parties. The style with which Capone will surround himself until the day of his death will be a strange mixture of the luxury of his days as a big shot and the sparse and ascetic life of the penitentiary. In 1947, at the age of 48, Al Scarface Capone dies of pariasis of the brain. Its cause was the syphilis he had contracted during his days as the manager of Johnny Torrio's brothels. The gangsters of the 1930s are a new breed. Not for them the luxurious life of the prohibition racketeer or the protection of grateful politicians. It is the era of the fugitive bank robbers, their lives a cycle of holdups, shootouts, and wild spending sprees. Most, like Bonnie Parker, Clyde Barrow, and pretty boy Floyd, end their days on a mortuary slab, their bodies riddled with police bullets. You are taken alive to await the agonies of the electric chair. Of all the many outlaws who will become household names in the 1930s, one will be idolized above all others. John Dillinger, also known as Snake Eyes. In a 10-year career of lawlessness, Dillinger will become the hero of the American press, hailed as a new Jesse James. By the day of his death, he will be the United States official public enemy number one. John Dillinger was born in Indianapolis on June 22, 1903. His father, John Dillinger Sr., ran a grocery store. The family lived in this modest house in a peaceful part of town. When Dillinger was four years old, his mother died. Soon after, his father sells the grocery store and moves the family to the country. Young Dillinger grows up on a farm in Mooresville, Indiana, southwest of Indianapolis. His dislike of small town life is intense. In 1924, at the age of 21, Dillinger marries. The marriage lasts only two years. Soon after the breakup, Dillinger takes his first step into the world of serious crime. An ex-convict who manages the baseball team for which Dillinger plays recruits him as an accomplice in a robbery. The pair hold up the local grocery store, but the venture misfires. Dillinger is arrested and charged. He is advised to plead guilty on the promise of a lighter sentence. He does and is rewarded for his cooperation with a jail sentence of 14 years. Never again will Dillinger trust anyone but himself, and never again will he allow himself to stand in a court of law. In May 1933, Dillinger is paroled from Michigan State Penitentiary, having served nine years. 
he emerges into an unfamiliar world. The United States is deep in the misery of the Great Depression. It is a time when men can be sold to employers at a public auction of labor. With no training and little education, Dillinger is faced with a breadline, or at best, a meager living. But John Dillinger has no intention of going straight. In prison, he has already learned the rudiments of his future trade. Within weeks of leaving jail, Dillinger has assembled a gang. In less than four months, they raid a string of roadhouses and banks in Ohio, Indiana, and Pennsylvania, netting tens of thousands of dollars. But Dillinger has been clearly identified by witnesses. He has a characteristic habit of vaulting bank counters during the course of his robberies. Dillinger's haul of cash is to be put to a particular purpose. He has not forgotten his former convict friends still languishing in Michigan State Penitentiary. Preparations for a jailbreak are put in hand. Dillinger arranges that guns be smuggled into the prison. But on December 22nd, 1933, with preparations made for the jailbreak of his friends, Dillinger's own luck runs out. Police raid the boarding house run by the married sister of one of the convicts. Before he can reach for his gun, Dillinger is dragged from the woman's bed and arrested. On December 28th, he is transferred to Allen County Jail in Lima, Ohio. By now, Dillinger's convict friends have made good their escape from Michigan Penitentiary. They are quick to return Dillinger's favor. Posing as police, they enter the Lima jail and shoot the sheriff dead. Dillinger and his rescuers make good their escape. Realizing they are marked men, the gang's first move is to attack a police station, stealing a submachine gun, sawn off shotguns and pistols. In their first bank raid together, Dillinger and his new gang robbed $28,000. Their next target is the First National Bank in East Chicago, Indiana. As the raiders run from the bank with $20,000 and two hostages, Dillinger shoots a police officer dead. For the first time, he is wanted for murder. Eleven days after the East Chicago robbery, Dillinger and his gang are arrested without a fight in the town of Tucson, Arizona. Three members of the gang were staying at a local hotel when the building caught fire. They offered a fireman $12 to carry out their trunks. In their room, the gangster's arsenal of weapons was in plain view, and the police were immediately tipped off. Defying strict legal processes, the authorities bundle Dillinger into an aircraft and fly him from Arizona to Indiana. In Arizona, he is wanted only for robbery. In Indiana, he faces murder charges and the electric chair. Struggling and swearing continually, Dillinger is chained to a seat for the entire trip. Dillinger arrives at the Chicago Municipal Airport on the night of January 30th, 1934. The atmosphere is charged with excitement. He is besieged by reporters and cameramen. Already the reality of Dillinger, the bank robber, jailbreaker and cold-blooded murderer has been overtaken by Dillinger the legend.
Dillinger is rushed from Chicago airport to Lake County Jail at Crown Point, Indiana. There he is placed in the custody of Sheriff Lillian Holly. The sheriff boasts to newsmen that she can keep John Dillinger. He boasts that she cannot. In an extraordinary testimony to the strength of the Dillinger myth, the county prosecutor, Robert Estelle, and the sheriff pose for photographers with the outlaw. The prosecutor's arm rests affectionately on Dillinger's shoulder. While Dillinger awaits trial in the Lake County Jail, his gang are transferred to Ohio to be tried for the murder of the Sheriff of Lima. On their arrival in Ohio, they are met by heavily armed guards and driven in convoy to the Columbus, Ohio prison. Within weeks, Dillinger's three accomplices will be tried and convicted of murder. Shortly afterwards, two of them will die in the electric chair. At Lake County Jail, vigilance is being gradually relaxed. Armed guards no longer patrol the adjoining streets. But there are still six armored doors between Dillinger and Freedom. Working secretly, Dillinger uses two razor blades to carve a fake revolver from a piece of old washboard. Brandishing his piece of wood, Dillinger disarms his guards, taking one hostage. Through a kitchen and out a side entrance, Dillinger and a fellow prisoner, Herbert Youngblood, stroll unmolested. At gunpoint, their captive guard leads the way. Youngblood climbs the high backyard gates to check the street beyond. Dillinger and his hostage casually stroll through the police garage. It is unlocked and unguarded. The street outside is quiet. With their hostage, the two outlaws turn left into an alley and make for the side door of the main street garage. The garage owner is taken hostage. Adding insult to injury, Dillinger and Youngblood, with their hostages, escape in a car belonging to Sheriff Lillian Hawley. Within days, both the sheriff and the county prosecutor will have lost their jobs. A postal worker has witnessed Dillinger's escape. Phoning the police station, he is told that he is crazy. He is forced to tell his story three times before he is finally believed. In his greatest feat of daring so far, Dillinger has made one fatal mistake. By crossing state lines in a stolen car, he has become the legitimate prey of the FBI. By 1934, under the direction of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI has created a new type of law enforcement officer, the special agent. Hoover believes that the FBI must become the most dedicated group of lawmen in the country, the incorruptible Raise and right utterly single-minded. Do you solemnly swear to support and defend the FBI recruits the undergo States a rigorous program of training and weaponry federal law, and forensic science. At the agent's disposal are the FBI's own sophisticated laboratories for the identification of blood samples, fibers or poisons taken from the scene of a crime. The Bureau has also assembled the largest collection of firearms in the country. Virtually any bullet can be matched to the type of gun from which it was fired. Soon after Dillinger's escape from Lake County Jail, a special Dillinger squad is assembled. Its members are determined to capture the outlaw, alive or dead.
Dillinger's trail from Crown Point first takes him to Chicago, where he abandons Sheriff Lillian Hawley's car. Dillinger is twice spotted by detectives, but escapes. By March 13th, he is in Mason City. By the following day, he has reached St. Paul, Minnesota, and has teamed up with his girlfriend, Billy Frischetti. The landlady of the boarding house at which the couple are staying tips off the police. Billy and Dillinger escape by a back staircase and a hail of bullets. Dillinger is shot in the leg. In the town of Port Huron, the FBI have cornered Dillinger's fellow jailbreaker, Herbert Youngblood. In a vicious gun battle with police, Youngblood wounds the local sheriff and kills the deputy sheriff. Believing that Dillinger must be somewhere in the vicinity, armed agents mount roadblocks around the town. But they are searching in vain. John Dillinger is in Minneapolis, having his leg wound treated. The treatment will cost the doctor two years in jail. A few days later, Dillinger and his girlfriend, Billy, are sighted in Carthage, Illinois. On April 6th, they abandon their car in Mankato, Minnesota. Another stolen car takes them to Noblesville, Indiana, only a short distance from Dillinger's hometown of Mooresville. On April the 8th, Dillinger takes Billy Frischetti to meet his father on the family farm. Even John Dillinger Sr. has succumbed to the Dillinger myth. He believes that his son robs banks but would never kill. He is convinced by the outlaw's claim that he would never hurt anyone. The fugitive's family has been quick to cash in on the sensation caused by Dillinger's exploits. They have traveled from state to state speaking in cinemas on Dillinger's loving and generous nature. By April 12th, Dillinger is in the town of Warsaw, Indiana. Billy Frischetti has been arrested in an FBI trap. Dillinger has now acquired a new accomplice, Homa Van Meter. The pair decide to replenish their armory from the town police station. At two o'clock in the morning, on the Warsaw Main Street, they kidnap Jed Pettinger, the only police officer on duty, and force him to hand over the keys to the police arsenal. Inside the police station, Pettinger had grabbed the machine gun wielded by Dillinger. While the two struggled, Homer Van Meter could not get a clear line of fire. Instead, he struck the officer with the butt of his revolver, knocking him cold. FBI activity in and around Chicago has become intense. Dillinger and Van Meter head north, meeting en route with Tommy Carroll, Babyface Nelson and their girls. What is needed is somewhere quiet and isolated, somewhere to lay low for several weeks. On the shore of Star Lake, they find just the place they've been looking for. It is the Little Bohemia Roadhouse. The proprietor, a Mr. Wanaka, becomes suspicious. The FBI are summoned and surround the house, but the barking of Mrs. Wanaka's dogs alerts the gang. Immediately, there is a burst of gunfire. In the ensuing battle, three local men driving by in their car are hit by police bullets. One is killed. Dillinger and the gang flee by a rear window, leaving their girls hiding in the basement. Dillinger, Van Meter, and Tommy Carroll make off by the lakeshore. Babyface Nelson hangs back, shooting and killing FBI Special Agent W. Carter Baum. The Special Agent is the 14th death to result from Dillinger's exploits. Almost as many again have been wounded. In 
In the aftermath of the Little Bohemia shootout, Dillinger and his gang hijack a car from a local couple. The following day, the car is spotted and chased by police. Tommy Carroll is fatally wounded, but the rest escape unhurt. Dillinger realizes that his face is now far too recognizable for safety. His solution is to have plastic surgery. It is a crude and dangerous process, and his appearance is altered little. No plastic surgeon can disguise the eyes which gave Dillinger his nickname. At noon on Saturday, June 30th, 1934, John Dillinger stages his last bank robbery. With the streets of South Bend, Indiana crowded with Saturday shoppers, Dillinger and Homer Van Meter walk casually into the Merchants National Bank. Dillinger announces his presence by firing a burst from his machine gun. The gang kill a policeman and escape with $28,000. They force hostages to ride the running boards of their getaway car, but police open fire regardless, wounding two hostages. In spite of the lengthening trail of dead and wounded, the exploits of John Dillinger continue to arouse the admiration of the American public. But the federal authorities are determined that the scourge must end. J. Edgar Hoover, chief of the FBI, takes the unprecedented step of putting a price of $10,000 on Dillinger's head. It is a friend of Dillinger's, a brothel manageress called Anna Sage, who takes the bait. Dillinger has planned to visit the Biograph Cinema in Chicago with Anna Sage and some friends. FBI agents are ready and waiting. It is July 22nd, 1934. At 10.30 p.m., the show is over. Dillinger and his companions leave the cinema. Suddenly, sensing that he is in danger, Dillinger begins to run. It is too late. Without warning, the agents open fire. Dillinger reaches a nearby alley before falling to the ground with four bullets in his body. America's public enemy number one is dead. There is a strange postscript to the story of John Dillinger. Several witnesses to the shooting outside the Biograph Cinema claim that the man shot had brown eyes. Dillinger's eyes were a distinctive steely gray. For years, it will be widely believed that the dead man was not John Dillinger, but a stooge set up by Dillinger's friend, Anna Sage. It is a powerful testimony to the enduring strength of the legend of John Dillinger. Mm -hmm.